What I want to talk to you tonight about is uh, I, I'm, I've got two things up the front here, a little bit hard to see. Um, one, one's a bit of rock, but it's a really special piece of rock because it's a piece that I picked up, a place called the North Pole, our North Pole, which is up in the Pilbara. And um, it's made up of lots of little wavy lines and uh, for those of you that um, are aware of some of the geology of the state, this of course is a piece of fossil stromatolite. And it's a great piece of fossil stromatolite, not because you can find any evidence of fossils in there, but the nearby cherts have preserved filamentous cyanobacteria that we can age at about 3.45 billion year mark. So it's actually the early evidence of life on Earth, right here in Western Australia, and still sitting in those landscapes. And that tells you something very important about <coughs> these landscapes. They're very old, they've been sitting in the same place, and there hasn't been a lot of change. And that's going to be part of the thing that we're going to see, is the way in which um, many of our species and our bushland have evolved with, within this splendid isolation without major changes occurring. And that's why we have so much mining, because all of the mineral deposits haven't been folded up, deposited, buried under uh, great glacial alluviums um, or volcanisms, buried them all. It just sits around on these landscapes. And the organisms that have come onto these landscapes have lived in old, stable, and most importantly, infertile landscapes. And Exhibit B um, is part of that journey, and you all know what this is. If you don't, you should leave the room immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Carnaby's Forage. It's Banksia menziesii, the firewood banksia. Um, I've got this in King Park um, with my permit. And um, it's a really interesting plant because, of course, we're the home for Banksia. So the eastern states have about eight species and subspecies, and they're actually a, a, a far-flung arm of the Banksia genus. But in Western Australia, they diversified and went nuts. So we've got about 80, 83 species and subspecies in Western Australia. And they really diversified here in a big way. And again, old, stable, infertile landscape. But the reason I'm showing you this is because if the museum had allowed me to bring the fossil banksia cone, the oldest fossil banksia cone, from collected in the Carnarvon, uh, in the, uh, the ranges just outside of Carnarvon, um, and I held that up, you could barely tell the difference between the two. Um, and Mary's holding something up in a book. That's, there it is. That's a picture of the fossil. There you go. There's a picture of the fossil. It's sitting in there. You could barely tell the difference. And so it's really fascinating that it looks as though Banksy got a great engineering solution to surviving in the continent. But what an amazing engineering solution because that Banksy fossil was 50 million years ago. And so the same engineering still works today. And I think I'm just using that as an example to get it set in your mind that we are dealing with a level of um, seniority in our landscape that you find nowhere else on the planet at all. And they're values that we're only just starting to appreciate. So let me now take you on a little bit of a journey through some of that and then talk a little bit about what we've done to these landscapes. And I am preaching to the converted uh, a little, I realise. This is a, an image, um, I dug it out today because it's one that I, I really love. Um, it's from the Homes of Cork collection. It, it's the, one of these wonderful uh, dioramas, panoramas that was uh, uh, painted in 1834 by a guy called Robert Dale. He was assistant to the government sur surveyor. It's a great image. Um, you can see good quality copies of this. but. It's the very much the European view of the landscape. They tried to interpret the kingias, like palm trees, um, many of the native plants, which you can actually almost get to the genus, are all very much stylized and pushed into the European form. And I use this as an example of the way that we started, even at that point, to misread the landscape because we thought everything was going to operate on a European time clock. You can see how that, that wasn't the case. 
This is Georgiana Malloy, down in Augusta, 1840. I'll let you read that. But what an amazing woman she was. Um, it was only actually in the 1980s she actually had a plant named after her right after she died because she was one of these unsung great heroes. She was a great collector of plants. And the way she wrote about the bush there is I think the way we, when we walk in bush land, when you hear the talks and walks that are going to happen this spring, that's the sort of same joy. And, you know, bush just keeps giving this great joy. And, and given this is like one of the best seasons, particularly in the um, northern wheat belt area, I, I said to a group last week, I said, if you don't go out and look at the wildflowers this year, you're not a West Australian. Pack your bags and go somewhere where we don't have, because it is a stunning season. I had the great privilege to be outside of Mulwell recently, and it's, it's beyond the beggars believe. So get out there and live a Georgiana Malloy moment. So she saw these values. And it's very interesting what happened to that whole value system that we developed as a culture as we've moved along. And um, we've, we've had the ebbs and the flows. And sadly, most of the time, it's been the ebb in terms of the, uh, the, the values that we've placed on these bushland areas. But Georgiana Malloy was looking with very simplistic eyes at the flora. Now I remember when I started out my botany course at UWA, and I'll tell you the date, and then you can guess my age, I could have been a child prodigy of course, <laughs> but it was 1972, and I was lectured by a wonderful person, Neville Marchant, who um, was a guest lecturer, inspiring educator, and at that stage we had the princely sum of 3,400 plant species in Western Australia, we thought that was blooming good. We're of course now 12,000 which is, just shows you how we underestimated and undervalued what we had. So again, we, we're developing the eyes to understand the richness. And if Georgiana Malloy had been able to go up to this tick-infested little patch of scrub heath um, <laughs> at a place called Mount Benia, it's the largest privately owned bush reserve, six square kilometres of perfect intact heathland, several DRF species, um, on the property, so it's got its own endemic species right next door to Mount Masua. Think of that, six square kilometres, and it's stunning. And we have some major research plots there, and these are some of my, uh, some of our German colleagues, and we've got major study sites up there. And um, um, they were saying, oh, you have such an interesting flora, it's so complex, it's so rich. Um, and I said, how rich do you think? Oh, it's just like our southern Bavarian grasslands. I said, OK, let's do a little test. So I plopped myself down not far from here, and I said, within arm's length, I will sit here and we'll see how many species I can collect within arm's length. And these are the, some of the things we collected within arm's length, and we got 80 species, just on 80 species, just within arm's length, and with that, they went with their tail between their legs back to the Bavarian grass they to try and get those out of the pieces. But it's a wonderful example of just what we have when you bother to embed and immerse yourself and start to try and interpret. Of course, this is the great mission that we all have is to educate people that that bit of scrub that we were knocking over in the 70s um, with Guy Bannon, it's the 50th anniversary this year of some of the big land releases in that northern corridor, the tragic discovery of trace element deficiencies, and it was a tragic discovery, it meant they could open that land as the 50th anniversary when we saw that as scrub. Of course, we now know it as a much more different and rich area. And these are some of the species that we have the great joy of living in this biodiversity hotspot. We are called a biodiversity hotspot not because we've just got the most fabulous wildflowers on earth, that's important, but it's because we've also lost 60% of the landscapes on which they sit. It's a classification of threat. So it shows you that we have important things. And some of these things are really top class. Many of you all know the old, good old Albany pitcher plant. It's one of my favourites. I, I did my honours degree working on carnivorous plants in Western Australia. These are the Drosseras and the bladder warts and the rainbow plants, amazing species. And why did I work on them? Because we actually are the richest place for insect 
well, animal eating plants on Earth in the Southwest. We had more species of plants eating animals in the Southwest than all of the species of animal eating plants for the rest of the world. It's all here. And Darwin, who was absolutely besotted with two things, orchids and carnivorous plants, had he bothered when he came on the Beagle to Albany and got off and went over to Lake Seppings and had a look at the last remnants of the then summer sun dews, he would have realised there were rich things happening. And he would have also seen Kephalotus growing there. And why is this important? Because it's a single species in a single family, totally isolated, <coughs> a climate refugee from the Gondwanan split, we think this is going around the 20 to 30 million year mark, still sitting in Western Australia. Perfectly happy living in its little micro refugia that are like stepping into a piece of what we think would have been Gondwanan rainforest. Very damp, very wet. And of course, it's one of its great, uh, one of the hints to its ancestry, it grows during summer. So I've got pots of these at home. The days are getting longer, they're getting warmer, and I'm starting to get all the pictures starting to develop. I'm going, ah, there you go. You're, you're just a little tropical refugee. But monotypic families, as we refer to them, are really rare on the planet. And we've got others as well, Emblingia. Now, anyone here know Emblingia? Oh, the education system. Emblingia, a single species, in its own single genus, in its own single family, all isolated in a little patch of country up around uh, Lake Indur. You'll find it up there, just near Inyaba, north of Durian Bay. I get to take whole uh, bus loads of keen professional botanists just to go and pay homage to this little prostrate ground cover plant. It is a far-flung ancestor of Campanulas, that somehow got lost here, we think about 80 million years ago, and it's remained, and it's the sole member of that entire lineage, still living, perfectly happy, stuck up on that sand plain. But there are more interesting things, I think, that tell us exactly how old we are and how stable this environment is. You need to look no further than the Dasypogonaceae, big mouthful, but that's a kinia. So this Kingias are in the Dasypogonaceae. And the Dasypogonaceae, you know them everywhere. You'll, there's um, a whole range of Dasypogon bacterias and other things that sit in this family. So it's got multiple genera and lots of species. And you find them virtually in all bushland throughout the southwest. And Kingia is like the, uh, uh, the pinnacle of this group. And why is this an important group? Well, it's except for one thing that grows over in uh, uh, Victoria, the family is only found in Western Australia. But what's more important, the new molecular work done by my colleagues at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, um, and they're all here right at present, uh, looking at our native tobaccos, and that's another story. What they've discovered is Dasypogonaceae is in fact in its own order which is the next level up. So your species, genus, family, order. We are the only place on Earth with its own order. Nowhere else has its own order. Europe, for example, has, doesn't have its own endemic plant family. And we've, got, we've got eight of them shown here. What's more important about Dasypogonaceae is it was being trodden on by the last dinosaurs. So it's been sitting exactly on these landscapes. It never took a long holiday, it never left our shores. It's been sitting here for around the 120 year mark, which in anyone's estimation is really the Guinness Book of Records for evolutionary persistence. And why is this the case? All of these plants that you see here live on old, stable, and fertile landscapes. They're the key drivers that have given, we believe, these extraordinary diverse species. With the only thing happening to drive the evolutionary engine being the simple process of climate drying and climate wetting over periods of 10,000 to 100,000 year periods. 
And when you look at the climate maps that we take way back for the last five to 10 million years, which we can construct from the, the ice core data, you find that you, you get lots of seesaws and that wetting and drying acted as one of the great batteries to keep the whole engine of evolution going. What kills evolution is a great glacial ice sheet several kilometres deep. The last one we had, which was five kilometres deep, was over the Darling Range and that was about um, uh, 250 million years ago, pre the evolution of the flowering plants. So the flowering plants came after that. And so very few places on Earth, particularly the Northern Hemisphere, which was all glaciated and these great bulldozers, essentially destroyed the flora and when they retreated you've got a rampant weed flora following the retreat of those glacial sheets as well as of course it was very cold where the sheets didn't go major alteration you essentially got what i say to my colleagues um, in europe um, when i had the pleasure of visiting them i said it's so nice to be in a stabilized weed flora because that's <laughs> essentially what european plants are that's why when they travel to this to places like australia it's a field day because they come up against plants that have lost the competitive edge. Except, of course, some of our acacia that we've taken to South Africa. And that's <laughs> another whole story and a little bit of a national embarrassment. So essentially what we've left with are these great examples of a Darwinian evolution operating at a pitch with those elements preserved by the very nature of the great stability that we've got in these environments. Here, this is a little photograph that I've taken just down south of Nana, which is an amazing place. I love it down there. Because we've got pineapple lilies, um, dasypogon, fabulous thing, and kinias. We're talking, again, these are all sitting around in forest systems 120 million years. And you know, we're only just starting to understand some of the ecology of things such as the pineapple lily. It has one of the world's most extraordinary root systems. It has complete novel ways of moving water up and down its root systems because it's spent 120 million years perfecting exactly how to live on those landscapes. The big question, and this um, is what my colleagues from Kew, uh, who are over here present, what I've challenged them with is why for 120 million years, 120 million seasons of producing seed, did not any of these groups, this entire order, ever jump offshore? And it's we're, we're considering it now <coughs> to be one of the great paradoxes of broad-scale, what we call long-distance dispersal. Now we have examples of one little genus, for example, the genus Styphelia. It's a native blueberry, member of the Ericaceae. Little thing that was had big, long, white flowers. Flowers in the Jarrah forest on some of the laterite uplands north of us, flowers around um, May to June, very early flowering. We've got an example of that, where we find it here, one or two in East Australia, and then the next spot you find it is Hawaii. So it managed to get its business class ticket to get up there quite comfortably. But why didn't we, and that's quite a recent species, we think that's around the eight million year mark, why did these things never bother to go offshore? And we suspect the real reason is that they did. But what they found were young, fertile, competitive landscapes. So they were volunteering, but never establishing in those environments. It was more Australia, in splendid isolation, had developed the perfect solution for living on this continent, but it was not a passport to being able to colonise other environments. And that's where we've begun to learn a lot more about how you put systems back together here. It's very much more complex than what you have in the Northern Hemisphere. And I've got some examples of that coming up shortly. And by the same token, and this is my, my last example, of exactly how you preserve this sort of time capsule of evolution can be seen in this non-descriptive plant. This is what it looks like right now. This is growing out at Cannington Swamp, the Allison Baird Reserve. It's also in Brixton Street wetlands. If you can find it, you're very good because it took a, almost a year uh, um, in two winter periods for us to finally get our eye in for this thing. It's in the, 
It's the genus Trichotheria. It's in the in, uh, family, the Hydatolaceae. I'm only giving you all this for completeness sake. But this little plant really hit the top 10 <coughs> charts of plant botany uh, about eight years ago when a colleague discovered, when they did the DNA uh, fingerprinting of this species, they discovered that this plant was right down at the very origin of all flowering plants. It's what, and ants, that's what the first flowering plants look like. That's a blind up photo. It's about as big as my little fingernail. That's a large one. The flowers, you can hardly see. And as I put up there, these are flowers before the evolution of the petal. So the petal hadn't been dreamt of. The petals, of course, are just modified leaves. This predates that. And we suspect uses thrips, things that are common diseases of plants, uses thrips as its pollinator, which is something we're still working on. Everything about this plant is archaic. And I won't go into the endless anatomical and embryological details, but it is an extraordinary individual and growing right on our doorstep here. You only preserve species like that when you have, and we're the richest place for this family. It does occur, there's one in India, and there's uh, one in New Caledonia and one in New Zealand, but we've got most of the species in the southwest. You only preserve those by having all of those key ingredients that drove the diversification. So, sorry, I'll just start this. So, the other key aspect is, and this is on a loop, notice this is the time going here. This is Gondwana. At 135 million years, we had the origin of the, the flowering plants. And at that point, Gondwana was in fact, we believe now, the hub of the first flowering plants. They started at that point, and then the partners took away with them their little elements. Australia drifted north. It's the only continent that stayed disconnected. I want you to just concentrate. So this is Antarctica here, there's Africa. We're getting to the point the dinosaurs are starting to vanish and we're starting to get to the point of the first origin of flowering plants, probably sitting around Antarctica. But notice what happens to India. It's the Maserati of the continents. <laughs> it's, it's the continent that moved at the greatest pace straight north. That's what makes the Himalayas and the Himalayas keep getting pushed up at a great, at a great rate. I only point out India because it's an illustration of why we have so much richness. India has virtually no endemic families or species at all. It actually was part of the Gondwanan partnership and got all those ancestral plants and should have done the, the right thing if only it had stopped at a point like that. <laughs> but what it did was it went through the equatorial climatic filter at such a pace nothing could adapt with the change that it went through. It's like a radical climate shift and it cleans the continent of all of those basal floras and essentially it's adopted what we refer to as the Eurasian Indo-Malayan elements came in and occupied. And they've got their own species of course because there's been enough time uh, for that to um, uh, for that to occur but um, it doesn't have the richness we have by virtue of the fact that we just sat up, sat off, tilted, went round a little bit, but actually stayed as this fairly isolated little patch of rock stuck out between the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. So, with all of this great evolutionary capacity and this great diversity, it's interesting that we're now moving into the phase of starting to understand some of the ecological processes that drive the assembly of those systems. And the more we look into this, and I use this example, this is Colin Yates, who's a wonderful ecologist who now works for Deepport, but uh, when he was working with me, uh, we did an assessment of a, a Jarrah tree in Kings Park. And this is work uh, that goes back a number of years, but it still holds true. If ever you get asked, what's the value of an urban remnant tree? Well, this will tell you. A mature Jarrah in Kings Park supports 83 species, 6 to 5 genera, and 38 families of native animals. Many of those are invertebrates, but it shows you essentially got a condominium. It's a high rise of activity. 
And why is this important? Because if you look at something such as these thinned wasps, these are all the sexually deceived male wasps that operate on our orchids in the southwest. And it might be an obscure example, but you're actually sitting in a biodiversity hotspot for sexual deception in the southwest. <laughs> if for plants, that is. <laughs> and these wasps, they're parasitoid wasps, they lay their eggs, and I've got a little life cycle to show them, they lay their eggs on a scarab beetle larvae, but they rely on their carbohydrate reserves on open flowered myrtaceae like Jarrah and Mary and um, uh, all, of, all of those groups that have big open face flowers. You get rid of those large elements and you start affecting simple things like the orchid pollinator network begins to collapse. And just to refresh your memory, if you haven't seen the process, this is uh, some great work that's been done with colleagues at the Australian National University where we're identifying the pheromones that are released. So this is a hammer orchid. In fact, this is a hammer orchid just growing um, uh, down at the southern end of the freeway. And it's producing pheromones from the hammer end. And we've done uh, the work with yeah. ANU where we've now isolated the chemicals, we've synthesised them, and we've shown that this hammer structure here, which could look like a female wasp, we can actually get the male to attempt to mate with a black map bead with the chemical on it. So mm -hmm. it's it's more that the chemical deludes the male to such a degree that it just believes anything is mateable. And it <laughs> <laughs> so what we've got... And you'll see it's got an elastic hinge. The wasp does this, and it's this perfect positioning of, of the pollen with the wasp. And so alluring is the pheromone. You can see an awful lot of other males are also trying to get it. And you'll see a male there with a little number tag. We actually number them. <laughs> it was a particularly good male, that one. Um, <laughs> and so all of these wasps rely on the carbohydrate reserves from things like Jarratree to keep them going and surviving and retaining their life cycle. And that life cycle is a really interesting one because it also shows not only the connection to a carbohydrate reserve, but also shows that the orchid and its interactions are very symbolic of what happens in old stable environments, you begin becoming complex. And what we've got is not only the sexual deception, like I said, we've got more orchids here that use sexual deception than the rest of the planet combined. But the orchid itself, we now know, and it's a bit hard to see down here, but this orchid uses a special fungus, and all the hammer orchids use their own fungus for germination. Although it's got a green leaf, that's for making carbohydrate, making uh, photosynthesis, of true photosynthesis, <coughs> but it gets all of its nutrients via a fungus that gets it from the organic materials in the soil. And if you put the fungus with the seed, which is dust-like, you get this spontaneous germination. And that halo of white material you can see there is in fact the de facto root system of those baby orchids. Then connect it through to what we're now piecing together is the life cycle of the wasp and things become more complicated. There's our token member of the eucalypts. The male wasp takes his flightless female for a nectar feed because she needs the carbohydrates to be able to dig down the 20 to 30 centimetres to find the scarab beetle larvae on which she then lays her single egg. She then digs her way back up. She'll do this about three to six times laying at a moment of time before she actually begins to fall to pieces because they get all their protein resources from that scarab beetle larvae where they were born and they only, they only have carbohydrates. And so for about their six week flying period, this is all that they are built to do is to reproduce and the orchids have learned in that six week period overlap with flowering time and you have a very effective pollinator. Now this is highly specialised, 
and you think, gee, this is all going to fail. But it works well in stable environments. It works well that we know that the scarab beetle larvae only works on the root system, decaying root system in certain native plants, because they're always here. We know that the wasps are perfectly comfortable getting their nectar resources because it always has been. But the fungus, although it's a highly specialised and our slowest growing fungus recorded in the orchid family, and that's a big family of flowering plants, although it's slow growing, it's the best adapted for the white sand lenses where hammer orchids grow. And importantly, that fungus relies on that specialised environment to keep it and the orchid in perfect harmony. You put all that together and you can see there are lots of failing points in the system where if you, for example, don't manage the native plant that supports the scarab beetle larvae, you'll quickly lose the wasp. Your orchids will be then facing what's called the extinction death. That is, the orchids will keep coming up each year and flowering, but they won't be pollinated. Keep it intact and the system's remarkably successful. These orchids have some of the most successful pollination rates recorded in Australian orchids because they guarantee what's called outcrossing and they produce a single flower and there's almost 100% chance that you'll get seed set. But it's a high risk strategy, not though if you're stable and have a long period of standard isolation. Now, sorry, I gathered this um, slide from somewhere else. Um, it's, it is my slide. Um, I wanted to finish up with, with talking a little bit about where we're at in terms of the repair of landscapes and some of the losses that we've had in these landscapes. And I had the, the great joy um, last August to have a joint billing with, with this lady, who many of you will know. Don't need to introduce her. Nobody knows her. Jermaine Greer, Greer yeah. And um, uh, it was really interesting. I told some... Uh, um, uh, people in Perth, I was at a, at, a, at a business lunch, I said, oh, I'm, I'm speaking with Jermaine Greer next month, and it was extraordinary. It all came out, all the stuff, you know, from <coughs> uh, uh, her books and, and all of other ways, but she, she spoke to me and she wrote this, that she's seen this country through the, through the eyes of somebody who has been in other battles and saved and worked on saving other things. And she's now had an epiphany. She's now restoring a major piece of uh, uh, wet forest in Eastern Australia. And she sees now the greatest battle for this country is Australians connecting, protecting, and enhancing our natural resources. And really eloquent, and I think we're going to see a lot more from her. And, and why is this important? Because this is today's newspaper, mm -hmm. if you saw it. Um, terrific, terrific to see that getting page nine. Uh, uh, it's extraordinary. Olympics are over, I guess, is the reason. <laughs> but good on that. But, you know, these, we, we sort of, it, it falls off the tongue, doesn't it? 16 mammals extinct. Six in the past uh, 15 years, four species um, were added in the last year. Uh, extinction is an extraordinarily devastating concept. If you talk about the extinction of the human species, I'm sure we'll do something quick about it. And I have the, the great honour to sit on the Federal Threatened Species Scientific Committee. This is the committee that um, decides on the species that get listed for federal listing. So this is where carnivies comes from and we get the protection of many rare and wonderful plants and ecosystems through this committee. And the work of that committee is not only astonishing in terms of the scientific rigour in the process, but it's also just heart-wrenching because the workload just keeps increasing and it's astonishing. But in some respects that workload is stuff that as an Australian and as a biologist I'm absolutely delighted to be up to 1am reading my seven to 800 pages before each meeting because it's voluminous but it's, it's needed. And these are some of the animals that we sadly as a committee can't do anything about to protect and we've lost them. And we will keep cranking up the extinction or putting our foot on the extinction accelerator if <coughs> we're careless and continue careless behaviour. I was speaking to Piers a moment ago about 
the green growth plan, a euphemism for something which I'm not quite certain what, but they are very much, um, as we were discussing, I said, it sounds very 60s, so I think it's more 70s. Um, um, it's, it's very much where we were, but we're now on a new journey to, to a new place. And the Underwood Avenue bushland, and I was just looking at it today, and now that I'm no longer a public servant, and apparently now a noted scientist as of last week, um, um, I did my honours degree in there, and I thought it was an astonishing piece of bushland back then. And I think there is no way we, as Australians, should be losing one square centimetre of these last precious, precious remnants. Everything sits on a knife edge because things have always been in these stable environments. And we've, we've arrived with large-scale changes and we're not doing enough to repair and bring those back. And of course you can see that this is, I've only got this up to um, uh, 2005, but it shows you the unrelenting urban spread of Perth so that we're um, one of the most sprawl-based cities on Earth, 170 kilometres from north to south. Uh, a colleague of mine with the uh, unusual first name of Storm, but his name is Storm Cunningham, and he wrote uh, a book called Rewealth, well worth having a look. And he referred to when we were chatting and he was doing the research on his book, he said, you are really the home of what he calls degenerative wealth. That is wealth created by degenerating the natural capital in which we live. And you don't need to do that. And of course, we, we now have, have wiser eyes. And, um, but this is, this is a little sobering reminder because this, this is me. That's a bulldozer. And you'll see, I get ordered out. Oops, there you go. Bugger off, who are you? That's a little place called Honeywood. Have you heard of Honeywood? Fabulous piece of Bankshire woodland. I was there, devastated, got that little bit of footage and I thought, isn't that amazing? Just two years ago, we're still knocking over Bankshire woodland. And I just think, how tragic is that? And there were so many things, there were Ligenias, there were orchids, um, uh, Mitrosacmes, you name it, they're all in there. And I just thought, this is astonishing that this, this could happen. But I think we're in, we're in a good space. Even though we've got amazing, these are the, this is the state, the percentage of threatened species to priority ecological communities sitting um, in the Swan Coastal Plain area, and we, we carry a great weight. And this is what we started with, with Banksia Woodlands, that's all the green. This is a, a map that's shortly come out in our book that's coming out on Banksia Woodlands. Um, that's what we had, that's what we've got left. That's the red bits. Now you all know that, so we've destroyed 60% of it. I'm bringing this up with you because the exciting news is that, as you know, there's a listing for Bangshu Woodlands of the Swan Coastal Plain. It's sitting with the Federal Department. That listing is now in its final stages. The great news is the boundary that you see there is the boundary. All those little bits of red bit, all those little pieces of red will be enshrined and protected if it now goes through up to the minister. So we're very close to finally saving the last 40% of our Bankshire woodland. So the little bit of honeywood that we saw happening, I hope that that is consigned to the archives along with a lot of other footage that have, uh, of past uh, devastation that we've done. So although there's bad things have happened, I think we're now in, in a space through the federal process where we're going to see that level of protection and all of these things that are happening with threatened species to prior, priority ecological communities will will be part and parcel of that. And it's not just stopping there, there's now a proposal to list all the true woodlands and I would encourage any other people who want to talk to me about what is the listing process and how to do it. It's very complex, takes a lot of work, um, but it's a great mechanism and it will provide every little patch of banks of woodland with the same protection that Carnaby's has. That's very powerful in the scheme of things, or a rare orchid.
or a panda if you were in China, for example. So really interesting days ahead. And I was um, also mentioning to Piers that one of the intriguing things sitting on the committee is almost anything that we bring up about particularly urban conservation of Western Australia has come out the listing. It's almost taken as read because they say you are a place with astonishing levels of degradation and loss. So listing of the Wheat Belt Woodlands, which was the first multi-listing across a broad landscape of all the woodlands, which happened last year. Astonishing document. Really encourage you to have a read of it. That would not have happened 30 years ago, but it was it sailed through with less than an hour's debate on the merits of listing the Wheat Belt Woodlands. We all know they're essential and critical, but nationally it's very clear that Western Australia uh, has a very sad tally, and so the process is very clear. And this is my own personal experience. Can you hear that? <laughs> this is my own 160 acres which I took over last November. I didn't know it, but I have all three cockatoos. Wow. Um, the red tails, annoying. I just wish they learnt to go to sleep at a reasonable time. I've got two large lakes on the property, which of course are prime water sources. This is uh, in the hills just above Waruna. That's one of the highest points above Waruna. Um, the property extends over the back. And I took that just um, a week ago because 170 carnabies arrived to sit at the lake. And I was like, uh, yeah. astonished. And, I, and looking at them, I was not only overjoyed, but also reminded that we have corralled them into these last vestiges. Yeah. And I, I want to leave this planet knowing that we have preserved and protected them. That Banksia Woodland listing is probably the biggest single gift we could give to Carnabies at this point in time. With the other side being, we should buy all the macadamia and almond plantations in Western Australia <laughs> and hand them over because that's a wonderful temporary forage resource and it's something I've been promoting with a number of people. Instead of doing offsets, let's just buy the macadamia plantation, let's buy the, the enormous almond plantation, the pistachio plantations out near Corrigan, which cannabis think is it's absolute junk food for them, but it's such critical food and they get high calorie value for variable effort. And that wonderful article that was in the Ed West uh, about three months ago on Carnabies. If you didn't get it, I'm happy to send you a copy. Mm -hmm. I've got it, which talks about the effort a Carnabies goes through to chew through either a, a Banksia cone or a Mariner and the small amount of energy it gets out. So that's why I'm saying if you don't have macadamias and pecans in your garden, plant them now because Carnabies will love you forever. <coughs> the little we have left is well worth protecting. This is work that we've been doing now for the last 11 years in Kings Park. It's something that I picked up that we were losing our <coughs> remnant large trees in all of our bushland. And when I went along the coastal plain, I could see it happening right up north and south. It wasn't Chewitt's, but it was Mary's, and it was particularly Jarrah's very early on. And um, it would affect them by them firstly going yellow. We called it chlorotic decline syndrome, CDS. You get what's called intervenal chlorosis. Uh, we thought it was an iron deficiency. We now know it is manganese, which is interesting. It's a very rare trace element that uh, causes this chronic deficiency. They will stag head, and that marry. The chewet is adapted to alkaline conditions. The marry is not. That's got about three years to go before it will die. And these important framework plants that are remnants of those bushland um, need to be managed and we've now discovered the whole reason this is a phenomenon is because we're pumping water from alkaline aquifers and that alkaline water locks up the manganese almost instantly. Two simple solutions, stop watering your lawns, easy to do, or you put manganese supplements. We developed a system, um, uh, I actually went to Bunnings and bought a Kasha, you know those sprayers? because I worked out we could put manganese feed into these uh, probes, drilled out some holes, and we were able to save one of our most significant jarrows in Kings Park, which is sitting uh, not far from the wall memorial by doing those injections. And we're now trying to do those injections, but we're now trying to inject 
uh, and acidify and source uh, the water coming in through the irrigation system in Kings Bar. But all up and down the Swan Coastal Plain on the western part, you'll see this chlorotic decline syndrome. We're trying to encourage local councils to change their watering practices to protect those species. Now this is very controversial and I would never have used this slide before, but I can now. <laughs> Um, this is the view from my house. I, I, I live in City Beach and lived there for a number of years and I anguish each autumn and I anguish during the winter and spring when I have to put up with those sunsets. They are a new threat that's pervading our landscape. It's easy for ministers to give, this was something in June 2015, $20 million to a traditional burning program. I always say to people who come and say, wow, what a wonderful sunset. I said, no, that's our biodiversity sitting up there. Why is this a bad thing? I don't think in evolutionary history we have ever had winter and spring fires that, this, that our ecology and our species have adapted to. It's fundamentally logical to any thinking human that you don't go into an English bluebell woodland during bluebell season and chop it all down because you say when it dries off it's all going to be dangerous but we do it in our bushlands everywhere and it seems to pervade the psyche sure protecting of people and asset is paramount and important but this i think is an unforgivable travesty that again is a careless disregard for the sensitivities of the ecology of this state and I'll, i i put it up to remind us all, whenever you see that smudgy sunset, think of the plants and the animals that are up in that smoke. And I think it's time we start taking stock. I can see papers in 50 years' time being written about this time, about what we did to these landscapes, e.g. prescribed burning at the wrong times of the year that have led to localised extinctions. And why is this... Uh, um, why do I speak with a bit of authority? Well, I'm going to give you an example from King's Park. That was 1939, the distribution of belt grass. Been introduced much earlier. That's it in 1987. The size of the holes show you how much there was. Why did it happen? Because between that period and that period, they started to burn. Mm -hmm. And they were burning on rotations of three years. They were all spring ignitions. Now, belt grass is just an indicator, we used it as a map, a surrogate of mismanagement. And we in fact converted what was at that stage, because we've got the detailed transect from 1939, an ecologist called Alison Baird mapped big transects, we found them in the archives, and we were able to go back to her transects, which were over in this part of the park, and retrace her steps almost to within the yard, because she used yards of measures. And so we know, and she wrote from 1930, from 1939, we then did 60 years on in 1999, we reassessed that bushland um, to find what had changed. Now, sure, belt grass had changed, and that was the work that um, was great work that Bob Dixon did to discover the selective control of belt grass. But what we discovered from 1939 to this point here is that there's a whole lot of species those species have gone missing. Now, it wasn't the belt grass. Belt grass was a symptom of the burning patterns, but it was the scale of the burning, the frequency of the burning, and the timing of the burning that took away all of the fire-sensitive ericas. So these are all the leucopogons, um, uh, some of the cedar astrolomas, um, many, all of the non-re-sprouting herbertias went we lost our hybanthus from that part of the park as well. All of those sort of things went, and we knew they'd gone because she recorded some of those, but also our reference communities that we've started to use had all those species. And we know we can link that directly to the impact of prescribed burning. So a careless action like that has permanently altered the face of King's Park. We're now doing a big study on native bees who depend upon those species, and we're going to be comparing this remnant to intact remnants to see, because native bees depend upon those species for their nectar resources, to see whether what happened in this trajectory here actually has led to the decline of those native bee communities. 
And my guess is probably they have, because native bees use different resources at different times of the year. Now also that level of carelessness can mean you get other consequences. Alison Baird, um, back in uh, by the late 50s, wrote a paper about the impact of burning increasing the abundance of Alicajarina in Kings Park bushland. And this is the 2009-10 drought season. Um, again, I'm not a public servant. I wasn't allowed to show that image up until now. Um, <laughs> Uh, the minister said this is uh, un, uh, what was the words uh, an unnecessary um, uh, an unnecessary situation, and we will move on from that. Um, and this is Alicajarina fraseriana, massive death. You can see already that we've lost some of the bigger. Th so this was a large jarrah, long gone from that system, uh, just a stag sitting there. But that system had been lurched into a particular carrying capacity of Alicajarina because of the high fire frequency. So Cajarina is a seed producing species and a re-sprouter, so it goes into an abundant cycle with high fire frequencies. Not all species with those attributes do it, but this is one of them. And its carrying capacity was far in excess of what that bushland could carry for the water availability, particularly when you started moving into climate changing scenarios. And as a result, we just got this radical collapse canopy. It also, because of that high carrying capacity, it of course was smothering out a range of other species. And we know Jarrah, we know our Marys, but importantly our four key banks here, which are Menzizii, Attenuata, um, Grandis, were in decline, with Grandis the next species to go, and Alyssifolia down to the last two specimens in that bushland. Mm -hmm. And yet we know from 1939 that Alyssifolia was all over the southwest portion of the park. Gosh, careless management has had major consequences on this great icon. So, to conclude with, I started by talking uh, about uh, Olmsted and that, um, and we're going to finish up with a European landscape, so that's fine. But uh, this is Blenheim Palace, and um, this is Capability Brown, so this is from uh, around 17. 80, and um, uh, this was a reward for some of the landed gentry for uh, winning a war against Louis XIV. And Capability Brown was the person that began people rethinking about nature. He was the person that began putting in uh, trees and groves of trees. It was he who, who started to think that the connection with nature and natural landscapes was important for people. And as I said at the beginning, he became a celebrity beyond par. And Capability Brown and some of his predecessors, because this movement had started and he just picked up on it and, and grew it in, into an astonishing phenomenon, um, he developed these landscapes that still survive today because he designed them around that. For example, he would plant oak trees and then thickly plant around the oak tree to get a big straight trunk and then he would get the gardeners to keep mounding earth around the trunk to keep the trunk nice and straight so it didn't fall over so that when the rest of the forest grew up he had nice straight oaks. But as he said, he was planning for around 100 to 200 years from then. So he was thinking ahead. And I think what Capability Brown and then um, Frederick uh, Olmsted's when he won the competition to develop Central Park, what they were thinking about was the future and the future of nature and natural landscape for all people. And in Western Australia, I think we're blessed in that we don't have to create a Central Park, we don't have to have Blenheim Palace. We've got wonderful natural gifts that nature has been the great designer, uh, capability nature, let's call her, um, has created those and we don't need to recreate landscapes and I, I would look at these images and say, remind ourselves that we can walk in a piece of bushland that is fairly intact today, and let's keep it intact for future generations as a living memento of the great evolutionary experiment that is the southwest of West Australia. Thank you. Mm -hmm.